Bonjour, Nino et Maganadouk. Minok, Jeb. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, virtual event here at Native Child and Family Services. This is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, our event is uh, themed around reforming Indigenous child and family well being. My name is Bob Goulet, Mjakwat Nishnakas, Migazi and Dodem. I'm a Nibising and Anishinaabe from Nipissing First Nation. I'm so happy to be your host, big supporter of uh, Native Child and Family Services of Toronto here, one of the premier child and family services agency across Canada. I want to welcome each and every one of you to our broadcast today. Thanks for joining us via Zoom, uh, however you're joining us. Uh, we are virtual for the most part, we, but we do have our speakers that are live here. And it's great to be face to face. It's nice to see May. It's nice to see Jeffrey. The deputy prime minister is here. The mayor is here. He's off his uh, campaign, uh, campaign stop and he's joined us today. So we're really happy to have the mayor here and a lot of other guests. The first, so we're going to start things off in our way as Indigenous people, as we do, as Neha, as Nishnabe, as Teltan, as Métis people, in this really good way, by acknowledging the spirit, by doing that in a ceremonial way. We're going to start with an opening song, and I'm going to introduce you to Roland Baldhead. Roland is Neha, Cree, from One Arrow First Nation in Treaty 6 territory. He holds a Bachelor of Education at the University of Saskatchewan and has been a, you know, a strong leader as a student and represented youth uh, in Saskatchewan for the Federation of Indigenous uh, uh, Nations and the Assembly of First Nations. He's also the language teacher here. So please welcome to sing our opening song, Roland Baldhead. with uh, what are called in our language the words that come before all other words. We're going to call upon our uh, knowledge holder here at Native Child and Family Services. Uh, Lita Sove is, uh, is uh, a Crow clan from, uh, and she's a woman of two nations. She's Teltan from British Columbia and Neha Cree from Saskatchewan. She's been a long time resident here in Toronto for over 49 years and has worked to serve the Indigenous community uh, for the last 28 years, uh, holding many positions to support and advocate for family and children. She's a mother of four adults, grandmother of three children, and also a ceremonial mother and uh, doing that in a good way. So uh, to offer us our opening uh, invocation, please uh, welcome Alita Sobe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna go right into it because we have a lot to share with you today. Um, but before I do, I just want to, again, I want to acknowledge my grandmother, Awijima, and my uh, mother, Hosle Ma, uh, Crow Clan women from Teltan Nation. Uh, I want to also uh, acknowledge all of the residential school survivors who are watching and who are here, and all of your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. We're moving forward and we're still here. And I'm deeply grateful to be able to address you this morning. So, with that, I say, 
uh, in my language, uh, I'm going to address uh, creation in my language and then switch to English so you know what I'm talking about. So, Chachalona Hotia Adigadenitia, Zamita Kolma Ushie, Saskia Ushie, Nehia Ushie, Medicho Adigadenitia, Medicho Etsu, Medicho Etsia, Medicho Edla, Medicho Etaa, Medicho Saskia, Medicho Chioni, Medicho Sas, Medicho Sascho. Uh, beautiful, great power up above um, here on behalf of Native Child and Family Services of Toronto on this day of truth and reconciliation to offer up our gratitude for the opportunity to be in this beautiful day and to share with you uh, and share with all of our relatives uh, this deep gratitude that we have in our heart that we're still here and that we get to breathe life, to feel the waters in our bodies, to feel the fire of life burning in us to have the Mother Earth sustain us still. We're grateful to all of our relations in all of the directions, in all of creation. We, we send out our deepest gratitude and greeting. And as a Teltan woman, I would also acknowledge the Crow Clan, the Wolf Clan, and also that grandmother white bear and the baby white bear that walks with me. And uh, I ask that you uh, bless this day and bless all of our thoughts, our actions, our deeds, and uh, increase the kindness uh, in which we do each and everything uh, in this life and say, made it chop, made it chop, made it chop, all my relations. Made the chop, miigwech, chimigwech, Alida, for those words. Uh, you know, it's so appropriate we come together. It's a, it's a very special day. Uh, this is uh, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. It's a day for deep learning. And that's really what uh, this is about. And I do want to acknowledge Alida, who is a residential school survivor. And, uh, you know, taught us, gave us those words this morning. When we opened up our, uh, our day around the sacred fire, doing that opening ceremony. So I do want to acknowledge Alida. And acknowledge all residential school survivors who are watching us from home, who are doing that work in the community to help us learn more about that experience and that uh, that really that tragedy that uh, Canadians are just beginning to understand in a real way, and that is the Indian residential school experience and that uh, that unresolved intergenerational trauma that is still with us as community members. I'm two generations away from residential school, but I carry that trauma. And many of us, even those who perhaps not even grown up in their home community, suffer from that experience. So uh, this is about that, uh, that journey towards healing and focusing on our children, focusing on our families. So it's wonderful to, to hear. To bring us greetings on behalf of Native Child and Family Services of Toronto is uh, going to be the board president and chair, uh, May Miracle. May, May is Mohawk, Ghana Gehaga from uh, Six Nations of the Grand River. She's a graduate of uh, McMaster University with a Bachelor of Arts and has a Bachelor of Education from Hamilton Teachers College. She's worked for the federal government as a consultant uh, for employment equ equity and human rights, but she's also uh, retired from a long career. That's where I met May when she was working for the City of Toronto. She is the President Chair of Native Child and Family Services. To bring us to greetings on behalf of the organization and the board, please welcome May Miracle. Thank you, Bob. Um, I just want to welcome everyone here today. It's a, a beautiful setting, a beautiful day, and, uh, and it's a great day for reflection and uh, on the truth and reconciliation on residential school survivors. And uh, over the last year, Native Child has been working with community, staff, and partners to recognize the accomplishments of our agency and also to acknowledge how much more work remains to be done. Our Decolonizing Child Welfare Learning Series outlines our history as a support services agency that was directed by the community to take on a provincial child welfare mandate. We continue to work with community to transform that inherited mandate through Indigenous self-determination, accountability, and service transformation. I want to thank all of the community members, staff, and partners who have come together to walk this journey with us over the last year. Children are our most sacred and precious resource, and their safety and well-being is our collective responsibility. Today, we'll be making some announcements and outlining some bold new directions 
will be taking to work together with partners and community to continue to work towards a coordinated and integrated service system across Toronto and Peel regions that keeps children at the centre. Thank you to our speakers and our guests and everyone joining us in person and virtually today. We look forward to our continued work together and in the service of the and safety, health, well-being, and prosperity of Indigenous children, youth, and their families. Thank you and welcome. Miigwech, Nyongwe, for that welcome, I mean, it's wonderful. And you do a lot of really great work in the community. Uh, yeah, you hear some background clapping, I know, uh, but we, we, we want to be people here, so we're going to be free to move about. There's going to be children, there's going to be families here in the centre that, uh, you know, we're going to make sure that, uh, you know, this is a, a really good event in that way. So we're not turning this into a TV program. So feel free to, <laughs> to laugh, be boisterous and enjoy the hospitality. Um, this, uh, this, a lot of this work that we've seen, the expansion of the organization, all of this has come under the leadership of, uh, of our next speaker. Jeffrey Schiffer is uh, the Executive Director of Native Child and Family Services of Toronto. Uh, he's a cultural anthropologist and a child advocate, and he's of both the European and Métis ancestry from British Columbia. Uh, he has a PhD in anthropology and an education from Columbia University, focusing on the decolonization of Indigenous child welfare in Canadian cities. So uh, he asked me to keep it nice and short, so we're going to do that today. But uh, he's got a, a great important message for us about decolonizing uh, child and family services. So please welcome Jeffrey Schiffer. Thank you so much, Bob. I just, I want to take a moment to just acknowledge Alika and Roland and uh, our fire keepers and everyone else who grounded us in ceremony. We had a a beautiful opportunity to start the day around the fire pit. You can see some of the green space behind me. I do also just want to thank um, all three levels of government for making this facility possible. It, it's through those partnerships with the City of Toronto, the, the, the federal government and the provincial government that we're able to have this space and that we could gather up in Treaty 13 on the land around a fire this morning with tobacco in our hands, um, reflecting on the day and the meaning of this day for us. I think that while I was in that circle, while I was looking around at, at all of the diverse people that had joined us, Indigenous and otherwise, um, you know, I was touched by the recognition that increasingly we see diverse peoples from every corner of Canada, from coast to coast to coast, coming together to recognize that not only are we on a journey of continuous learning about our shared colonial history, but we are on a journey of collective action, right? We are in a place now in Canada, where our government has proclaimed this day our National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. It provides an opportunity for all of us as Canadians to understand that we have a collective and shared responsibility to build a nation that honors Indigenous peoples, that, that takes the, the knowledge and the values and the tools and approaches that Indigenous people have stewarded for thousands of years across Turtle Island and use them in ways not only to restore safety and health and wellness and prosperity to those communities, but as sources of innovation and transformation for all Canadians. And, and that's really to a, a large extent uh, what Native Child is about. And, and I just wanna say that none of this work uh, that we do at Native Child is because of May or myself or, or anyone else. It, it is because of the full circle of all of us working together. And we have been absolutely honored over the past year to sit in circle with, with staff, with community, with partners, um, not only to honor and, and, and acknowledge the work that has been done at Native Child over almost 35 years, but, but to map out our collective future. And, and, and through that process of learning, um, to translate that knowledge into meaningful action. Uh, many of you will know that, that Native Child started uh, in, in the mid 80s, and, and it started at a time when the first generations of children were aging out of, of the 60s scoop. Right, they were, and, and in, the, in the city of Toronto, we, we saw indigenous youth flooding into the downtown core, right? And the community stood up and they said, we need an indigenous organization that is, that is focused on, on, on taking care of those youth, on threading culture back together, on healing families in Canada's largest urban center. And as was mentioned earlier today, we were directed by community to take on a child welfare mandate. 
And that's a challenging thing. Everybody watching will know that that's a challenging thing. Uh, as, we, as we continue to find the bodies of, of our sacred bundles buried across the nation, we understand that there has been nothing more destructive uh, in the lives and communities of Indigenous people than that legacy of residential schooling. And the way that that legacy was transformed into provincial systems of child welfare. We are in a strikingly transformational time in Canada right now where Indigenous peoples are standing up and through the continued creation and transformation of their own agencies, working to change that system together through a process of co-development with community. Our mandate is unique. It's unique because it comes from the, the provincial government, right? We, we can't, as many other agencies can, work with First Nations through laws under C-92. We are not a rights holder. We don't have jurisdiction, uh, but we have community. Right. And and we stand as a helper with First Nations and the urban indigenous community to to understand how to do that work. And I think that one of the things I want to highlight is the fact that while we have inherited a colonial mandate and, and done our best to transform it, um, we can't get to where we need to be without partners in government. Right. And and I remember I had the opportunity, the the blessing to meet uh, Her Excellency, the Honorable uh, Mary Simon, our first Indigenous Governor General in, in the summer. And I, I in, in, the, in the few brief moments I had to speak with her, um, you know, I let her know about my passion of of working to sort of decolonize child welfare to achieve better outcomes for kids. And she said she said to me, Jeff, reconciliation isn't just an Indigenous issue. It's a Canadian issue. Right. And we need to do this together. Um, and so I just want to say that um, I have been inspired and I am hopeful uh, because of the conversations that we have had over the last year with government uh, through the willingness of folks in the provincial and federal government to sit down with us and say, how do we make this system better? How do we get Indigenous self-determination and community voices into the way that we change provincial legislation? How do we build a better system for Indigenous children and families, not only in the city of Toronto, but across the province of Ontario? So, so for us, yes, this is the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, and we are here to, to honour our ancestors and our community members and, and, and to give thanks for all of the Indigenous families that made it through that history to where they are today. But we're also here to gather in celebration and hope and ceremony and community to understand how we take the work that we have done forward and move it into the future in really concrete ways. So, so I'm so excited to be making some concrete announcements about what that work will look like. Uh, but before we get there, I'd like to turn things back over to Bob and, and invite some of our other speakers up to the podium and really thank um, you know, Mayor Tory and the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, for joining us today. Miigwech. Thanks uh, so much, Jeffrey, for, for those, uh, those words. And I'm looking forward to the announcement and having a bit of a dialogue on that through our platform, through Zoom. You'll get a chance to ask those questions and, uh, and be able to, uh, to hear you know, some of those things that are happening at this, uh, this agency, your agency, one of the strongest agencies there are. Jeffrey, in his remarks, talked about uh, a, a critical word, an important word. And Jeffrey and I have... Uh, talked about this and we've worked together on some of this and that is the process of decolonization and a lot of people and i just, was just asked this week well what is decolonization i don't quite understand what that is decolonization we need to start with realizing that decolonization isn't just a metaphor it needs to be a, a purposeful corporate process where organizations even our own organizations begin to look at things in a different way begin to critique those uh, systems that we've inherited, that we continue to reproduce, the colonial ways of doing things in the city, in our country, in our province, and starting to change those. And the only way we decolonize is through the involvement of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. You can't decolonize in your own functional groups or in your own boards or around the cabinet table or around mayor and council table. It has to be done with Indigenous people. It has to be done in partnership. So that's an important part of reforming child and well uh, child and well-being services is to do that in partnership. So, you know, Jeffrey brings that, the organization brings that, and it's so wonderful to have partners like the city, like the government of Canada and the province of Ontario to be able to support those. Um, I spoke about decolonization. The city is embarking on that process of decolonization. I'm very proud uh, that uh, in April of this year, mayor and council passed the city of Toronto's reconciliation action plan. 
the very first section of that, hopefully people got a chance to leaf through it. The very first section of that is to undertake these reconciliation audits where the city and indigenous people will sit down to reform those. And those things don't happen without the leadership of people like Mayor Tory, who really have made reconciliation a priority. And uh, Mayor Tory, of course, is born and raised in Toronto. He's the current mayor, the 65th mayor of the city of Toronto, first elected in 2014 and re-elected in 2018. Under his leadership, again, the mayor and council adopted that reconciliation action plan, making that a priority, educating the entire public service uh, about the importance of truth and reconciliation. A very strong ally for Indigenous people, taking part in many of our events. I know I've hosted a few of them with Mayor Tory, so uh, happy to have him here. So please welcome uh, His Worship, Mayor John Tory. <laughs> Uh, Bob, thank you very much, and I'm so pleased to be here, of course, with uh, my friend, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, and uh, this is a person I can tell you from my own experience, and I, I know a number, of you, a number of you will have worked with her as well, that has um, probably the biggest open heart and the, and the best open mind of a lot of people that I've worked with in public life, and so I think that should be something that should be encouraging to us all in the context of the remarks that you made, Jeffrey, about how, you know, we were talking about this building, and this building, there's so many things that don't happen. And then there are things that do happen and, and almost inevitably the things that do happen are an effort that people have joined in together and that you have all three of the governments that we have in in uh, in, in place in in the country working together with indigenous communities for example to make something like this happen and when there's one missing it's never quite the same but in this case the federal government's very much been there and the city was very much a leader in, in this place that jeffrey you uh and and your team and may uh, run in such a way that whoever i think it was bob described it as the premier um, service delivery organization of its kind, and that's what it is. I have some very nice remarks here, um, and I'm not going to deliver them. And my staff, are, <laughs> my staff are entirely used to that. But I, I just thought, you know, it's a day of reflection, and I just thought I would tell you what I've been reflecting on today because some of it goes back to um, to reflecting. This, you know, we talked about how people don't really understand what decolonization means. I think that's true, um, and I've often said that. You know, I was a, a history student at university, and we spent no time on any of this. None. I mean, and, and I had four years of history that I studied, and that's no offense to the to the uh, faculty members. We just didn't talk about it. But I think the same is true of intergen intergenerational trauma. I think there's a lot of people that don't understand that. Why don't they understand it? Because they haven't experienced it. And, you know, I, I was saying, because there's a, this excellent a group of people making this documentary about, about care. And I said, well, you know, um, if you just think for a minute, as I did upon having the a discussion about, about care and about what they're looking at in, in particular with regard to indigenous uh, children who are in the care system. If you go through, and we were talking about the average number of families that people might've lived with in their young lives, and let's pick a number, let's say it's five. Um, and you contrast that with my life. And that's what I started to do right away. In my life, I lived in the same house with the same two parents and my siblings. And you know that result produced, produced whatever it is for good or for bad, but, it, but you are a product of your environment. How could there not be lasting effects on your life if you're living with five families uh, in, in a circumstance where between the ages of zero and 18 or pick a number, um, you are moving from place to place to place and there's no place that you can really call home where you can sort of get, root yourself and, and be respected and develop your own uh, identity within that context. And I think, you know, when you, when you talk about that, I mean, I also had, uh, it, it reminded me of the visit that I made and I made it as mayor and I made it because I wanted to learn sort of within the context of what you were saying, Bob. I went to visit a couple of the remote communities in Northern Ontario as mayor. And, and people asked me, well, why was I going? And I said, well, I thought it was important for me to understand, uh, given that we have the largest, uh, I guess maybe it's the second largest urban indigenous population in the country after Winnipeg, but certainly it's very large, about 75,000 uh, people that are resident in Toronto. And that if I wanted to understand some of the legacy of colonization or some of the legacy of residential schools, I should go to some of these communities. And there were many things I saw there I could talk about this morning, including water problems that I saw and that really just resulted from, you know, frankly, not lack of resources by governments, but sort of an insensitivity uh, as to how these problems were supposedly resolved. But my most impactful meeting that I remember to this minute, and it was in 2015, so it's several years ago, was with a residential school survivor. And the she told me many impactful things about her experience, but the most impactful of them that I've been reflecting on again this morning, but obviously ever since, because I've remembered it, was that she told me that when she was taken away uh, from the community to go to the residential school, 
and she survived, of course, but she said that they, they in, in stripping her of the um, opportunity to speak the language, that uh, she came home and over time she could no longer communicate with her grandparents. And I thought to myself, you know, one of the most important relationships I had in my life was with my grandparents. I'm a grandfather now, and I'd like to hope my grandchildren think the relationship they have with me is very important. But I can't even imagine the situation that would exist if because of the action undertaken by a system, not because of, there are circumstances, I suppose, where people can end up not speaking to each other because they wouldn't learn the same languages, but where you were prohibited from doing that. And that resulted in your inability to speak to and to know your grandparents, that that is going to have some intergenerational uh, impact. It certainly would have with me. My life would have been different if I hadn't known my grandparents the way I did. And so I think the value in this day uh, is not just to look at the history of what happened and to uh, make sure that people understand what happened, because I'm not sure most people did until actually quite recently, um, and the full extent of it and, and the degree to which you know governments you know, were obviously completely complicit in, in it happening, but also to reflect on, on, on intergenerational uh, trauma and inter the inter intergenerational impact of that history and how that makes it more important that we address issues of decolonization, that we address issues that are related and arise out of the history and that we take action. And I am proud. I mean, Bob was kind enough to mention that we had a reconciliation action plan. And, you know, I'm proud of it because it's a plan that's been thoroughly, uh, you know, put together and that has a very, a very extensive series of actions that will be uh, taking place over a number of years. I said the day it was passed, though, that I also was disappointed in it. And it was just ourselves we had to, to blame for that, if that's the right word in that it still was a document that came out of the city hall and it did result from extensive consultation with indigenous communities and indigenous leaders, but it was still a document produced in the city hall. And so I said, my fondest wish for that plan and it still is, is that each day that passes, indigenous communities in the city of Toronto take more and more and more ownership of that document. And if it needs to be tweaked and it needs to be changed so that it can become a document that is truly owned by indigenous communities and where we are the people that are helping to implement it, uh, as opposed to the ones that kind of wrote it, um, that will make me feel much better about what it is we're doing. And it'll have me believe that we're more on the right track uh, to do uh, the right thing. You know, because I think I think we were close with the plan because we didn't do it in isolation, but we didn't do it in that sense of turning over much more complete ownership. And I'm proud that even since then, we've, I, I went to, to visit with all the agencies, including this one, um, and listen to some of the challenges they faced. And they said things to me that fit, al fit along that same line, which is, well, on housing, it's been great that we've had all the discussions. Because as you will know, a substantial percentage, a very big double digit percentage of the homeless, people experiencing homeless in Toronto are indigenous. And we, we have to provide housing for them. We're having great assistance from the government of Canada in doing that. But they also said, John, like it's, it's just not gonna do if you're gonna sort of provide that housing and figure out what's needed and figure out who should put the housing together. We need to be real partners um, in, in that housing taking place so that it can be cultural sens culturally sensitive and reflect the realities. And so 20% of the money we got from the federal government has been allocated to indigenous housing. And the, the responsibility for that has been largely turned over uh, to Ms. Wibick and they're going to do it and they know how to do it. And they know the sensitivities that are involved and it will be a better product as a result. And they are real partners. In fact, I would say if anything, they're the owners of it. And we are the ones again, that'll be there to back them up. So that's nothing that was written down here, but you know, in a way, in a way it was more important for me just to say that on this day, I'm thinking about the woman that I met, I met several people that were survivors in those communities up north and what she told me about her grandparents. And it's important for me to talk about um, what I just heard in, 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 in the examination of care and the impact that, that care and, and the instability of care and the sometimes worse uh, uh, results of care can have lasting impacts that we still are dealing with today and we'll be dealing with for some time to come, which maybe should galvanize, into that, galvanize us into that action that you spoke about. So I'm very pleased and, and thankful for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Tori. And as a communication professional, I know what it's like to spend hours on a, a speech and it not being delivered. Um, and I work very closely with Chris Ebby, and uh, Chris Ebby told me that that's, uh, you know, it, it's the way of things. You know, you speak from the heart. So, uh, you know, we really appreciate that and we understand that. Um, and the guy who drafted that reconciliation action plan did a really great job. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Marilee Fullerton. Uh, she's the member of provincial parliament for the Ottawa riding of uh, Canada Carleton. She's a medical doctor and currently serves in cabinet as the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. And what I could say about the province is, you know, there was a time when child welfare was very, very, um, uh, it was very, very heavy handed. It, it didn't embody our ways of doing things, didn't embody our customs. And I think we're starting to see a partnership with the province to see the benefits of doing it in the Indigenous way, doing it in the ways and the customs of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And Marilee Fullerton is somebody that embodies that, uh, that understanding. Uh, she was first elected in 2018, also served uh, previously as the Minister of Long-Term Care and the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. And uh, Minister Fullerton is bringing us uh, greetings via video for over 400 people online right now. So uh, this is remarks from uh, Minister Fullerton. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this important event. We are together today to acknowledge Orange Shirt Day and the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. This is a day to remember and honor the victims of residential schools, the children who did not return home, and those who did, carrying the weight of trauma within them. This day is also about truly learning and understanding the culture and heritage of Canada's Indigenous peoples and listening to what you need to strengthen your communities. We are honoured to work in partnership with you as we continue to strengthen safe and culturally appropriate services and programs for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children and youth. Indigenous organizations such as Native Child and Family Services Toronto play an integral role in supporting the well-being of children, youth, and families. Ontario is committed to co-developing and co-delivering child and youth programs and services with representatives of First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and urban Indigenous service providers we know Native Child and Family Services Toronto has been supporting and strengthening Indigenous families through prevention and early intervention. And we're working together to improve the overall health and well being of Indigenous communities, who play such an essential role in supporting healthy families. You are helping to lead significant change. And your example encourages all of us to be better neighbours partners and leaders. We recognize that there is still much work to do to advance the learnings that we are gaining from the journey of truth and reconciliation. We are called to continue this journey, to make our country and communities stronger, building this bridge of understanding and collaboration is the way forward to healing and reconciliation as Canadians and as Ontarians. Thank you for your commitment to supporting children and youth. Together, we can create a better future for Indigenous communities in Ontario. Thank you. Miigwech. Uh, Minister Fullerton, your words uh, certainly bring a lot of truth. Thank you very much for sharing them uh, with us. Uh, we're very honoured today here at Native Child and Family Services to welcome uh, uh, not only a, a hardworking uh, um, representative of the local community, but the Deputy Prime Minister of, of Canada. Um, the Honourable Christia Freeland is a Member of Parliament for University Rosedale. She is Canada's Deputy Prime Minister and now the Minister of Finance. Um, Ms. Freeland has been, was first elected as MP for Toronto Centre back in July 2013. I did donate. Um, uh, she was re-elected uh, in a different university, in, uh, in University of Rosedale in 2015, 2019, and then uh, in 2021. She was sworn in cabinet uh, in 2015 as the Minister of International Trade and spent that time negotiating the free trade agreement with the European Union. Amazing work. And then uh, from 2017 to 2019, served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, negotiating the North American Free Trade Agreement. So that's a lot of feathers in your cap. 
Um, but in 2019, she was appointed uh, probably the most challenging uh, um, uh, um, capacity, and that is uh, um, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. And, and then she led a lot of the COVID-19 work for the Government of Canada. And most recently in August, last August, appointed the Minister of Finance. So please welcome the Deputy Prime Minister and the Honourable Christia Freeland. Okay, well, miigwech, thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Ça me fait un tellement grand plaisir d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. C'est une journée très importante pour nous ici et pour tout notre pays. Um, and I want to start by really thanking Alita and Roland. Um, he's over there. Okay, and Roland. Um, that was uh, a very uh, beautiful and centering way to begin our day. Um, and Roland, I did uh, really, uh, I was very moved um, listening to your drumming and to the Cree. Um, as usual, uh, I'm going to take a leaf from the book of John Tory. I have found never, you never go wrong doing that. And I'm gonna throw away my prepared remarks <laughs> and just say a couple of things that I've been thinking about listening to everyone here. Um, and so, you know, I wanna start by saying, um, you know, Bob was nice enough uh, to talk about some of the jobs I've done working for Canadians. And, you know, as foreign minister, as trade minister, as finance minister, my job is to go out and sell Canada to the world. It's part of my job. And I'm proud to do that job because I think Canada is amazing. I think we're the best country in the world. And, you know, especially outside Canada, I have confidence and a smile on my face when I tell people all the great things about our country. But today, and really every day, um, I also reflect on the fact that we're a country with a really profound original sin. And our original sin, I believe, is uh, how Indigenous people have been treated. Uh, and you can't love Canada and be proud to be Canadian um, without really thinking about that. Um, you said, Jeff, that reconciliation isn't just an Indigenous issue, it's a Canadian issue. And that is profoundly true. And it's important for us to think about it every day and to have some time, especially today, to all really pause and think about that. Uh, and I'm grateful to the people who have created this space for us today to do that. Um, second thing I want to, to mention really quickly is language and culture. And this is a place devoted to language and culture, especially for Indigenous children. And Roland, who sang for us, uh, is a Cree language teacher. And, you know, one of the things that I think is remarkable about Canada is the extent to which, as a country, we recognize the importance of language and culture for children. Mm -hmm. um, we have deep in our history being a bilingual country. Uh, more recently, but now more than five decades ago, we recognize that we're a multicultural country. And my own long-suffering children get dragged to Ukrainian school every Saturday morning, uh, precisely because I recognize in my own life as a Ukrainian Canadian, how important it is for my kids to have that grounding. And, you know, I won't say they love going to Ukrainian school every Saturday, but as they've gotten older, they see the value more. It's taken us a really long time to recognize that Indigenous children need that too, and probably need that more than any other children in the country, uh, given all of the intergenerational trauma, given the continuing racism that they experience today. And so I'm very grateful for your work. And 
I believe really profoundly and personally as a mother, um, as well as as a politician, that what the children here are learning is going to root them for their whole lives. And I'm grateful to you for doing that work. Third thing I wanna say quickly is I'm glad to be here to recognize and underscore the importance of paying attention to urban indigenous people in Canada. Um, I was born in a small town in Northern Alberta with a lot of indigenous people in the community, a lot of reserves nearby. And then I grew up in Edmonton and now I'm an MP for Toronto. And over the summer, I spent some time with the mayors of Saskatoon, Edmonton and Calgary. And I always spend time with my mayor, John Tory. Uh, and all of those mayors recognize something that the federal government recognizes as well, which is we need to pay attention to the very particular challenges that urban indigenous people face in Canada. And the work being done here is so important. And I want you to know um, that I recognize that our government recognizes that. Um, and then um, just finally, um, May, I uh, was moved um, by a lot of what you said. One of the things you said is children are our most sacred and precious resource. It is so true. And that's true of every child in Canada. It is so true of every Indigenous child in Canada. And today is a day for us to all say that and to do everything we can so that every Indigenous child hears that. Thank you very, very much um, for the opportunity to be here today. And I really look forward to hearing more from everyone. Merci beaucoup, miigwech. You were born in Peace River. I had to look that up. That's I did true. not know that. That's great. Yeah, I work with the uh, Little Red River uh, Cree Nation up, uh, up in Northern uh, Alberta. So great people, great people in the uh, territory. Then they increase, yes, for sure. Um, we uh, thank you very much. A big round of applause for all of our guests joining us today. Thank you so much, Deputy Prime Minister and uh, Mayor Tory. Thank you. Uh, we uh, do have a, a number of uh, great speakers to hear from. So, and we're going to also uh, have a, an announcement. A number of commitments going to be made to the community and uh, going to take your questions and uh, and part of the dialogue. But before we do that, we want to. Uh, Here's some singing. We have a, uh, a drum group called the Nipissi Singers and the McGurl Singers. Uh, they have a number of songs that they're going to provide to us. Uh, these, uh, these women's drum groups are from Alberta and uh, from Vancouver and Ontario. And they're going to sing the Strong Woman song. And I do believe they're going to sing the Grandmother's song. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, and they're going to introduce themselves as part of the video. So this is the Nipissi and McGurl Singers. Cheryl Siwi Bedeham Natsidasen. I am from the Little Red River Free Nation in Northern Alberta. Ani Buju, Jennifer Brimso, and Dijna Kaz. I'm from Serpent River First Nations in Northern Ontario. That's it. Uh, Debbie Bull from the Elizabeth Nation Settlement. Donita Large Nasigasa, Satellite First Nation. Renai Morriso, uh, Red Pegasus First Nation, uh, Little Pegasus, and uh, And we're really honored to be here on the, the, these territories of the, the Wendap and the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe um, being credit of this Treaty 13 territory. So thank you for allowing us to bring the songs here. And one of the songs that we brought to you today is a strong woman song. Um, that was shared with us many, many years ago. And the story about what that song was when Maggie Paul was in the Kingston Penitentiary with uh, Indigenous women in a, a circle of, uh, of uh, a powwow circle. And they put the powwow drum away 
and it was a lockdown, but the women all had their drumsticks. And uh, as everybody was getting locked down and pepper spray was being sprayed, the women who held their drumsticks were untouched after singing this song. So the song comes with such power, and that is why it's called the Strong Woman Song. I hope you enjoy it. Bless us, my mother. Be with us, my mother. It's a song that um, calls our grandmothers and our, our matriarchs to, to bless us with their presence.
Jimmy Gwetch, thank you so much, singers. Jimmy Gwetch, uh, Dewe Ganung, uh, Cheryl, Jennifer, Debbie, Donita, Renee, and Tracy. Give them a big round of applause. The Nymphacy McGurl singers. I have to tell you, I'm really impressed. Native Child and Family Services is doing this in-house. We got like a little production thing going on. We've got audio, we've got video, we've got video production over here, all being done by the staff putting on this uh, good work. So give a round of applause to the staff of Native Child and Family Services. Amazing. This is a day of reflection, learning about residential schools, uh, learning about uh, those things that really, you know, are the source of that trauma and how that trauma has been passed down, uh, uh, sometimes inadvertently, but you know, very purposefully through those assimilation policies of the government, through you know, the, that, that unkindness, you know, the loss of those values that we have. And it has impacted us in real ways, including our youth. Many of our youth are going through their, their lives without an identity, without knowing what it means to be Lakota, to be Neaha, to be Anishinaabe, to be Métis. And that is really a, a, the biggest tragedy of this is, you know, there's so many people in our communities that just don't know. They know they're different because of the color of their skin or that they carry a status card, you know, but don't know much about who they are and starting to find that. So I really appreciate the words from the Deputy Prime Minister that language and culture are important. But there are some individuals that truly persevere, that move beyond those things and really demonstrate and, and play a leadership role. I'm gonna introduce you to our keynote speaker of the morning. His name is Yama Maxi. He is Lakota from the White Bears First Nations in Treaty 4 territory. He's of dual uh, indigenous Lakota heritage and African-American. He's uh, African-Canadian. Uh, he is, uh, as we call indigenous, Afro-indigenous individual. He received the Indigenous Spirit Fund Award in 2021 for his outstanding efforts in breaking down barriers while achieving his full potential. After graduating the social services program in 2021, he was accepted into York University in the, in, in the bachelor's program there in psychology. He hopes to continue his education at the PhD level, working in the field of healing and wellness, looking after the needs of indigenous youth and indigenous families. Uh, he currently uh, works as addiction counselor for Addictions Rehab Toronto. So a big round of applause please for Yama Maxi. So who's got the tissue box ready because there's going to be some tears coming but uh i just want to first uh just say how grateful i am today and uh this day means a lot to me you know i thought about truth and reconciliation day and um you know during remembrance day we have moments where we pause and we take 10 minutes to or you know a minute to uh to reflect you know i hope this day you know we can take a minute in the future you know to reflect on the people that are no longer here you know my 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 cookum went to residential school and she was uh she died at the young age of 35. i have two uncles that um died by suicide that went to residential school and my whole entire family's been impacted by this so you know i hope we get to a point in this country where we can pause just like we do for remembrance day i just want to first thank uh jeffrey um for just being the person he is. Um, I don't think we've ever had, you know, someone like him who's, you know, an executive director who, who will call me and, and uh, say, you can call me at any time. You know, he's a real person. And um, that means a lot to me um, to, to have that type of belief in someone like myself. So um, I'm going to tell you about myself. So yes, uh, Bob did a wonderful introduction. He's a Tremendous MC for every event I've ever been with him. Um, but yeah, so I was born um, in White Bear First Nations. It's just by Regina, Saskatchewan. And after my birth, um, my mom, uh, we moved to Toronto and the child welfare system um, was heavily influenced in my life. Um, before my first birthday, I was uh, placed in foster care and I was separated from my two siblings. And, you know, for those of you who have brothers and sisters, you know how strong of a relationship that means to have your brothers and sisters. That was taken away from me. That was taken away from me. And uh, I didn't I didn't have my kinship with me. So, um, of course, that it definitely uh, left uh, an impact on my spirit. 
So uh, growing up in the child welfare system, you know, one of my first memories of being, uh, this is in the mainstream system, not in Native Child and Family Services of Toronto, but um, I had this uh, moment with my foster brother watching this movie, uh, Indian in the Cupboard. For those of you guys who've seen that movie, it's an old VHS film. Um, but uh, at the end of the movie, that was my first time seeing an Indigenous film and knowing that I'm Indigenous. Uh, I asked my brother, my foster brother, I said, uh, where are all those people? And he told me they, uh, we, we killed all those people. They're all gone. And uh, I started crying. I ran upstairs to my mom and uh, my foster mom and, and ran into her arms. And uh, I didn't want to be native. I was ashamed. I lost my identity that day, you know? Part of me died. And uh, I say that because this is memories that are tattooed in my brain, you know? And, uh, you know, growing up in the system, I, I experienced uh, all three forms of uh, abuse, physical, mental, and sexual abuse. And um, and the time I was 10 years old, I was already having su suicidal ideations. And uh, when I entered uh, Native Child and Family Services of Toronto in 2003, I believe is when the mandate started, um, I had a worker and uh, his name is Marlon Clark, and uh, he was just messaging me today. Um, you know, Native Child had workers that that believed in me. Marlon always believed in me. And he he told me one day, you know, you're going to be one of the very few people that beat the statistics that are going to go to university. And, uh, you know, that that belief meant a lot to me. So I went on um, in my adolescence and I, I, I discovered this uh, cool, cool substance called alcohol. And it tasted like medicine as soon as as soon as I I drank it because I had all this trauma, you know, all this um loss of identity I take this alcohol and it, it, it did something different to me than the average person and I fell in love I fell in love with drugs and alcohol and I chose that over you know the good path you know I didn't feed my kind wolf I, I, I fed into uh, a spiral that landed me um, walking around with two garbage bags um, being an addict uh, picking up cigarette butts off the ground and smoking them that's what my life looked like. I was going nowhere and, and had no faith. I was hopeless. I figured, you know, I'll just be like every other statistic in this world, you know, I'm just another indigenous homeless person as, as John was mentioned. Um, and I, I took back my power. I, I decided, you know, I ignited my fire and I, I, I chose to uh, be a warrior. So my people were warriors. And uh, 2018, I decided to, uh, take that back, that power back. You know, I'm no longer gonna let people rent space in my head. And uh, I got sober and I decided to pursue education and I went to um, Georgian College and uh, I went for social work and I uh, graduated with honors, even though I, I, at the beginning of the program, I could hard, hardly, you know, read properly or write. I, 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 I bet on myself and, um, and then I went to York University where I met uh, Professor Jesse Thistle, who's an amazing mentor mm -hmm. in my life and a person that I, I lean heavily on, you know, in, in hard times. And um, you may be thinking, though, the story's done, you know, that the man, you know, everything's given to him. It's just all uh, cake and sunshine from here. But um, it's not the case, actually. Um, last year, I um, someone asked me uh, earlier today how I was able to stay strong during this moment. Um, so last last year during Canada Day, I was uh, hanging out in a, in a um, low poverty neighborhood, um, Flemington Park, and I was just trying to hang out with my family. Uh, it was actually, um, yeah, so it was Canada Day, we're just watching the fireworks, and uh, next thing you know, um, I have blood dripping down my face and my, my hands because there was a shooting that uh, was, wasn't targeted, wasn't meant for me, but um, they just started shooting like crazy, and I got shot, and, um, you know, like I, <clears throat> but uh, someone asked me, how you know I was able to get through that 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 experience. I, I think I formulated my answer. I, I found my I found faith. I have a spiritual connection now that was once lost when I was a kid. And uh, you know, I pray all the time. And I, I thank uh, people like Jeffrey to have me up here and speak because uh, you know my voice matters and I will continue to tell my truth and uh you know hopefully inspire more people i was speaking to john before the beginning of the event i'll, I'll close here with this um 
I was speaking to John at the beginning of the event, and he said, uh, you know, I wish there was more people like you. And um, I wish there was two of you, I think he said. You know, my hope is that, you know, I can inspire more youth because getting up here and speaking is exhausting. So I want some some new youngsters to come <laughs> up here and uh, share their story. And, um, you know, <clears throat> I also want to thank Marlon for all he's done for me. He's uh, always believed in me and um, means a lot. I just want to um, close with, you know, you know, a person in this system, we, you know, we talk about courage and bravery. And uh, I always thought courage and bravery was, uh, you know, someone who could beat somebody up, somebody who had a bunch of money, who drove a bunch of fancy cars. Courage and bravery is someone who can get up here, who does this hard work for kids every single day, much like Jeffrey does, much like I'm doing today, who don't need the credit. I don't want no credit. <clears throat> I just want to inspire youth and change this cycle of our people. So thank you. Miigwech. Jama, you mentioned your uh, your role models, Marlon Clark, Jesse Thistle. You know, great uh, great men that do this work that are you know uh, you know people we should hold up in honor. But you're a great role model for a lot of these kids and the youth that are uh, that are here, not just in the system, but for youth right across the community. So, Jimmy, much for your words. Uh, uh, well, another applause again for uh, Jama Maxi. It is a special day. It's also a day where uh, we are going to renew some commitments, make new commitments to uh, to our community, uh, to the people that we serve. This is your organization, the families of uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit people in Toronto. So uh, to, to give us more on the uh, four commitments that uh, Native Child and Family Service is making, I want to reintroduce Executive Director Jeffrey Schiffer. Thank you. Every time I'm honored with hearing Jama speak, I'm, te I'm tearing up, so I'm going to do my best to hold it together. But like, I mean, what a, what a clear embodiment of, of, of what we were all saying earlier, right, about, about youth being our most precious resource and about, about, the, way about the way forward. Eh? So I just, I really want to acknowledge and thank you uh, for those words. And, um, you know, you talk about, uh, or you've said in, in such a generous way, how support from folks like me um, can help you in your journey. That is so reciprocal. I don't think, I couldn't do the work that I do without the, the current direction and motivation and inspiration from people like you. So I just, I really want to thank you. Yeah, mommy Gwetch. Yeah. We're over time and I'm a chatty guy. So I'm going to try to, <laughs> I'm going to try to be verbose when it comes to the commitments, but I just, you know, I, I want to take a bit of time to recap. Last year was Canada's first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, and we made a, a really conscious decision at Native Child to, to mark that as a special day for us, not only to, to honor and commemorate and reflect alongside all Canadians, uh, but to think about how we reset our relationship with community in a formalized way. Uh, to really continue the co-development of Indigenous child and family well-being services in Toronto. And so we stood up, we were, we had about 1,200 people across the province joining us last year, and we talked about how we were going to do a few things. We talked about how we were going to convene a special community advisory on child welfare transformation. We talked about how we were going to launch a learning series. Uh, and we talked about how September 30th every year was going to be a year that we stood up in front of community and talked about the progress that we had made over the past year. And this is, uh, I feel so privileged to be able to say that this is the, the first year that we are doing our report back to community, talking about um, the work of the past year and what we see moving forward in the future. And so four, four commitments uh, we are making today about our, our shared path moving forward. The first is... Um, and I just have to thank all of the community members that sat with us over the last year. 
Uh, we would do an episode of our learning series. If you haven't seen those, they're on our website. I invite you to check it out. It's hard to change a system you don't understand. We needed a point of departure. Our learning series on decolonizing child welfare lays out our practice as it, as it, as it happens right now at Native Child. And between every one of those sessions, we would sit with community and we would say, this is how it is now. How does it need to be, right? And through that process, through the knowledge and insight of people that have experienced and been using our services, we were gifted so much knowledge. So our, our first commitment, and, and we, we sat in circle with that community advisory, and we said, now what? You know, what happens after September 30th? Are we done? And they said, no, no, we are not done. There is so much more to do, right? And so really our first commitment is to not only continue, but to expand our community advisory on, child and, on Indigenous child and family well-being transformation. We will invite new members to join that community advisory committee. We will connect that advisory committee to other community advisories across the city, whether it's the one that operates right here at the at the uh, Mount Dennis Aboriginal Child and Family Center or our youth advisory or others. So we are committed to continue to sit and learn and be guided by that community advisory. The second commitment, and this is one that comes from community is, you know, we've talked a lot about how the, the collective safety and well-being of children is a collective responsibility. I, I was privileged to sit with, with, with the province at the child welfare modernization table uh, over the last year. <laughs> during the pandemic my, my 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 perception of time is is wild but you know what we learned and what is emerging through the province is an understanding that we cannot solve the problems that are faced by families that are connected to child welfare simply by doing child welfare we need cross-governmental cross-ministry intersect you know intersectional approaches to this right and so what i mean to say by that is that native child cannot do this work on our own. We can do a lot, but we cannot be everything to everyone. The problems are massive. And so the community has directed us to convene a new table of Indigenous service providers that will join, that will come together, that will be directed by the community advisory, and that will talk about how we better coordinate and integrate our services across the city of Toronto to support Indigenous children and family, focused on prevention and early intervention, sitting together in circle to mitigate the risks that families are facing so that children don't have to come into the child welfare system to address that overrepresentation, and 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 when children do need to be removed to a place of safety um, to really ensure that we are wrapping that family and programs and services to minimize that time. Mm -hmm. and, and I will say to you that I have been blessed in conversations with executive directors uh, across the city of Toronto who will be joining us. We're up to about six or seven agencies right now and more will come and we will be convening the first meeting um, of that table in October. The, the third, the third uh, commitment is really to recognize that, you know, as I've said previously, the tools and approaches that we use in the child welfare system under our provincial mandate are not Indigenous tools and approaches. They are legislation, they are assessment, they are tools that have been developed by the provincial government that don't always recognize and reflect Indigenous worldview. I would say, in fact, and I have said before, that some of these tools are, in fact, maintaining the overrepresentation of Indigenous kids in care. We have got to change the tools. There are a couple of things that are happening right now that provide opportunities for community members to be involved in that change. So the third commitment is that we will work with community to bring their voices and all the recommendations that we have generated over the last year into the process that is being led by the Association of Native Child and Family Service Agencies of Ontario to update and change those tools with our partners in the provincial government. The fourth one, and this is exciting to me, the CYFSA, the Children, Youth and Family Services Act, the legislation that governs provincially mandated agencies in Ontario is coming up for review next year. I wanna bring the voices of people like JAMA into the process of legislative change. We are committed to sitting with youth, with community members, with our advisory, with service partners, and bringing that process forward in a way that um, actually results in tangible legislative change so that Indigenous self-determination is the cornerstone of our transformational practice at Native Child. And I will say to you that I sat with the Assistant Deputy Minister and members of his team, and the ministry is on board for this type of community-directed change. And, 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 I, and I do believe that it is gonna lead to real impact. Um, I'm probably over time. I haven't got the hook yet, but I'm going to say before I go, 
I'm going to say before I go that because there is so much more to say and we have little time that all of the recommendations and process over the last year that we've generated with community has been compiled into a report. It's a 35 or 50 page report that is going to be released on our website today. If you want to get in the weeds and you want to hear what are the recommendations that are generated that we are going to be bringing to government, I invite you to please look at our website um, and, um, and, 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 and read in detail all of those recommendations. Hear the voices of the community that that are participating in this system and, and moving us forward to change it. The last thing I'll say is over the last year, we have been revising and updating our strategic plan at Native Child. And this process of walking with community and child welfare transformation has deeply informed that system. And so I just want to let everybody know that at the end of October, we will be releasing our new strategic plan and you will see these commitments and the voices of community reflected in the new directions of our agency. With that, I will just say Chi and turn yeah. things back over to Bob. Thank you. Yeah. Marci Miigwech, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, yeah, incredible commitments. I'm going to reiterate them a little bit later, but uh, I do encourage you to check out that report, check out the documentation, keep tabs on the work of uh, Native Child and the staff and the executive and the board. Uh, and you do that at nativechild.org. And there's contact information. If you have any questions, any suggestions, please send them in. Um, and if you have any uh, complaints, send them to Ron. <laughs> uh, speaking of Ron, uh, I'm going to introduce Ron. He is the Director of People and Culture at Native Child and Family Services. I'm just kidding. Don't send him. Ron is just such a kind man. We love to tease each other. He is Algonquin Nishnabe from Gijijo Minado Madowsk Reninawag. Uh, Algonquin Nation uh, in the uh, in the beautiful uh, Gitche uh, Zibe territory of this uh, of this uh, place. Ron identifies as two spirit LGBTQ2 plus and uses the pronouns he him and his. He's passionate about his work uh, applying cultural teachings. He was our Shkabewis uh, to Alida this morning at our ceremony, doing a great job. Uh, Ron resides on his hobby farm with his husband, his grandmother, and many many animals. Hopefully not just Hopefully not just urban animals. Uh, those are large black squirrels we have in Toronto. Uh, I just picture them being all, yeah. Um, but that's what Ron does. He's an active member of the community and just a great gentleman. So please uh, put your hands together for Ron Hodgson. Thanks, Bob. I, uh, I think you should just come around with me and you can introduce me where I go. <laughs> Uh, I uh, I welcome everyone and and I just uh, again thank you Bob that was so brilliant I, I sound so great uh, <laughs> I uh, this is one of the least favorite things that I do in my job I I'm not I I don't like speaking to cameras and I like speaking to people and I like spending time and connecting uh, with them so I was really really uh, happy and inspired today when everyone just drops scripts. Um, we have a lot to talk about and I think we have a lot to share and, and it's trying to compress everything we've done in a year into just a few moments is, is really, really difficult uh, to do. So I would like to start out and just uh, say Chimigwech and Medicho to our knowledge carrier, Alita, mm -hmm. and our drummer today, Roland, and everyone that's here, actually, we do have a live audience. Um, and the group really kindly set up a puppet for me. So I had someone to, to, to visit while I was talking to all of you today. Uh, I, I, when I saw the, the agenda for today, I immediately was like, oh no, Jamma's before me. I'm either going to like look terribly bad when I speak or I'm gonna be bawling. So uh, <laughs> luckily we're, we're gonna maybe be somewhere in between. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I've just been asked for, uh, by Jeffrey and the team to come and speak a bit about uh, the cultural uh, work that we've been doing at the agency and, and, and in support of the community. So a couple items that I think always just stand out for me and, and something that's really, really important for me uh, specifically because I come from a human resources background and a, and a, and a relational background is uh, growing a team that's really focused on Indigenous and uh, uh, recruitment and development and, and building a team that understands culture and uh, lives and breathes what we what we do as, as Indigenous people. So I'm really happy that I was asked to come and join the team and I'm very honored uh, 
uh, to be with everyone that's here, including a speaker that we're going to have later on, uh, Melissa Hammond, who is literally transitioning into the role of Director of, of Holistic Services uh, in the next day or so. Um, we also uh, are currently seeking a new Director of Child and Family Wellbeing. Um, we are very, very happy to have had the uh, current uh, Director, David Van Overdyke, to support us and build us up to where we are and, and it's time for uh, him to transition and he has so kindly agreed to mutually do that with us so I'm really really happy about that. Uh, for anyone that's worked with the Indigenous Spirit Fund, we've also uh, over the year hired a manager of, an, of, of the Indigenous Spirit Fund who is also a, a, a lovely Indigenous man as well. Um, for myself, I think something that's important is that when we're seeking Indigenous talent, that we have that within our own system and we've built that ourselves. So uh, we, we prioritized recruitment of an Indigenous recruiter as, as we came on and transitioned. So along with all that growth, and I think more importantly for, for the teams, um, we built our own cultural team as well. So over the last year, we've, we've uh, brought on many, many different workers helpers, Roland, our, our language teacher, uh, who work with our staff, our culture team, our child and family well-being teams, all the teams across uh, the agency to provide various services. I just want to list a couple of them. So I think the most important stuff that we do is, is the in-home supports and service delivery and how we've uh, embodied that and, and really focused on collaboration with our, our Indigenous child well-being team and our holistic teams to make sure that we're providing uh, services that are culturally grounded to our, our children, youth, and families. Uh, we've also uh, focused on supporting families with their healing uh, during some good times and not so great times and making sure that we're there and present. So that includes our, our, our staff going out and speaking to families and spending time with families while they're in hospital, while they're physically healing, uh, supporting them during births, rites of passage, helping families with their loved ones as they as they make their way back to Crater as well. Mm -hmm. um, some really hard work. <laughs> uh, so our land-based uh, learning is also occurring at our Glen Rouge National Park, uh, the Toronto Zoo, and then we have also uh, acquired our own uh, location near Clarendon Station, close to Perth, uh, in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people, and we're doing lots of land-based learning there. We also have the culture team doing uh, biannual cultural renewal for all the staff, which is coming up in just a few weeks, which I'm really happy to say. And uh, just on the last piece, and I'm going to plug this, it is our 25th annual powwow tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, being held at Dufferin Grove, uh, Dufferin Grove Park, it will include a sunrise ceremony. And again, our, our knowledge carrier Alita will be present as, as well as myself and many others. Uh, that starts at 6 a.m. We encourage you to come out and see us. Uh, grand entry will also be at noon. And in appreciation of the strong Indigenous community, we will be offering uh, complimentary food to everyone in attendance. I can't. <laughs> Free food. I, 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 <laughs> As just the last point and something that we the team really worked on and, and speaking about the, the in-house work that we're doing, uh, the group here and most of them are present today really worked on the Red Dress Commemorative Art Project, which was a project commissioned. Uh, we, so we commissioned a dress in honor of, of National Awareness of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two-Spirit People, uh, including the creation of an informative video. So if you haven't seen that, visit YouTube and visit our website. Uh, participants created two beaded red dresses. One beaded red dress was to keep in honor of MMIWG2S uh, to memorialize a family member or friend. And the second beaded dress was given uh, back to us as an agency and contributed towards a community art project, which included a photo book. So it's become a living legacy of uh, their artistic expression. So something really important that we did over the year, and we're really honored that we uh, continue to, to have, uh, have that dress on hand. So lastly, as I wrap up, I just wanna say a uh, huge team of to everyone, and most importantly, our community for your ongoing support, encouragement, uh, and for keeping us true to our purpose, including the mandate that we have as a Indigenous Child Wellbeing Agency. All of this stuff continues to ground us um, in our transformational work and um, this, the work that we're doing leading the agency and in Indigenous practice. So that's how we're doing our work different. And I'm really proud and honored that I get to share the space with all of these lovely people and the speakers we have today. So Chima Gwech, made it show. Miigwech, Ron, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, that update. And uh, yeah, so much. And again, reiterating, come out tomorrow. If you've never been to a powwow, you, have, uh, you haven't been to powwow in a long time. 
Dufferin Grove Park at noon. My good friend and our uh, helper, uh, uh, Pat Green, is going to be your MC. Great, uh, great stuff. I'm going to introduce uh, Jennifer Turner. She's a Mohawk, uh, Ghana Yage Haga from, uh, um, I don't know where you're from. Where are you from, Jennifer? What, uh, what community? Six Nations, very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, she's the manager of child and family well-being at Native Child and Family Services. Been with the agency for six years. Uh, she spent a number of uh, roles for the last 25 years uh, since completing her uh, formal education. In the last 20 years, dedicated to this work towards child and family well-being. Uh, she's been invited to various university classes and a guest speaker as, uh, as in Indigenous social services and social work practices. And she does also review files for other Indigenous child and well-being agencies. So please put your hands together for Jennifer Turner. Um, I wanted to say something to you, Pam, and it's awkward saying this. Um, I just want to thank you for your work because you, you're what keeps me going in my job um, because you're an inspiration to a lot of people. And, um, you know, you cherish your relationship with Marlon, but I can tell you he would cherish his relationship with you because you got me thinking about a young lady that I've had a relationship with for a long time since I was her worker. So I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm all in the field. <laughs> um, I'm going to go quickly because I know we're out, we're running out of time. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't like talking in front of the cameras either. I'll be honest with you. So um, we know we're in, we're working in a colonial system. We know it needs to change. We need, we all need to come together for that. Um, the community, the First Nations, the government, all of us. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, uh, but we've got changes coming. So I think that's what uh, keeps me going, uh, is trying to, to know that change is on the horizon. And keeping our kids always in the, the center of the circle, that's the other thing that keeps us going, right? We need to do the best job that we can do uh, for children so that they grow up and have the best life that they all deserve to have. So I've got a couple of little stats I'll, I'll share with you. I was going to talk about, um, you know, obviously with C92, the act that was enacted in, uh, in 2019 of June, uh, there are definitely changes coming. And, uh, and I think it's great. I think it's wonderful that uh, First Nations are going to be able to uh, provide their own child and family services. It's a long time coming. Um, it's a time of transition for all of us, right? We're an urban Indigenous agency. Um, so we're going to see what happens, right? We're going to see what is coming when there's enacted legislation. Uh, right now, we do have some, um, we have some, you know, sort of interim agreements with different First Nations on how they would like us to work with their members when they're living in Toronto um, and how, uh, you know, the expectations of when we're working with band reps. And uh, if there's any First Nations watching, I would welcome if you have any anything that you would like us to work collaboratively on with your members, please uh, let us know because uh, this is this is what we're dedicated to doing in the future. We want to take direction and we want to know how how can we help uh, work collaboratively with your members when they're living in the city. Uh, currently, we actually are working with um, about 83 First Nations across the country. That's the thing when you're not actually working on territory, you work with everyone across Canada. So that's quite a few um, First Nations. Um, we also have um, 49 kids that we're working with right now that are in customary care agreements with their First Nations also. Um, you know, we all want, our, want, want children to be at home and be safe in their communities, uh, in their home. Uh, but sometimes it, it, if that's not possible, we want to look at, you know, kinship options. Um, we also have 47 children that are in kinship out of care. So they're not in Native Child's Care. They're in uh, 47 homes with people that they love and, and know dearly. So that's a, another option we obviously are always looking for. Uh, that comes in, in large part also from helping, uh, sorry, uh, getting off topic here, uh, with um, our family finding team is very helpful on uh, being able to, to find out and, and uh, find our kinship home options for our children. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, 
The other thing is too, like with the First Nations, um, the one in particular, we, we have developed a very strong relationship with them and um, we have very good open communication. We take direction from them. Uh, we have quarterly reviews and uh, their supervisor and I touch base on the phone every few weeks uh, so that we can ensure that we have great communication and we're all working together for the good of their members. So again, if there's any First Nations out there, please give us a call. We, we would like to work together with you, uh, you know, and, uh, and yeah, it's all of our responsibility. It's all collectively our responsibility to make sure that children are, um, they're safe and they're doing well in the community. So let's all work together and uh, go forward into the future. Yeah. No, Jennifer, thank you so much. Our, our final speaker of the afternoon is, uh, or sort of the morning, is uh, is going to be Melissa Hamonic. Uh, she is Red River Métis from Treaty Run, Treaty One Territory. She's a Dejarle uh, by family and by clan. Uh, she's of the traditional Red River settlement in that part of the territory. Um, she's a proud member of the Métis Nation of Ontario. She supports Indigenous well-being across a range of sectors and is now the director of holistic healing here at Native Child and Family Services. So please welcome Melissa Hamana. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that I actually started my work uh, here at Native Child as a student and um, the sense of belonging and the sense of community and connection that I found here is nothing short of remarkable and that's because of the community and that's because of the staff community that are here and so I just want to acknowledge all of community that are out there watching us today and all of the staff community here at Native Child that um, we're called into this work this isn't just something we do this is this is who we are and so a deep mercy to our community and staff community for that. Um, we all know that the most effective prevention strategies, and by prevention, I mean wellness strategies, are family relationships, a sense of community, cultural connection, and a strong identity. And we all know that projects like the residential school project, ongoing colonization, works very actively to rip those things apart. And it's with that understanding that holistic services here at Native Child was birthed into being. And actually that's how our agency began was to provide holistic services, to provide programming that would strengthen families, that would provide a sense of pride and community and identity, and that would support healthy sovereign communities and further reduce involvement with the child welfare system. Another significant focus of our work is to work really closely with our child and family well-being teams to make sure that children and families are, who are interfacing with that system have as short a stay in that system as possible, and to make sure that there are supports not just for the child, but for the entire family, and thus the entire community and entire nations from that. Some of the tremendous work that's happening right now are at spaces much like this at our community hubs, which are truly multi-generational spaces. There's spaces for children, there's spaces for families, there's spaces for individuals, and there's spaces for our elders to really come together. And the supports that we provide are holistic healing supports, but we also provide a range of cultural supports and, and programming that's really guided by our youth. Youth like Jamma, thank you again. Shout out to Jamma, a huge fan over here as well. Thank you. Um, and I really wanna highlight something really exciting. Um, that's happening for us is providing more land-based opportunities for our urban indigenous folks, because that relationship that we have with land is crucial to our well-being. That is how we feed our spirits and how we are able to be who we are in our truest sense as caretakers of these lands. And so uh, I think Ron mentioned the camp that we have uh, north of Clarendon Station. And right now it's a really exciting time because we're working with elders and knowledge keepers of those lands and our uh, knowledge keepers and elders to really develop year round cultural camp programming that's very much aligned with um, seasonal practices and ways of being. So look for that um, coming up at the start of next year. We'll be able to provide that opportunity to all of our urban Indigenous community members. And I just want to end off by saying that culture and community, that is why we're here and that is the focus of holistic services is to ensure that community members have access to culture, community, and can really feel a sense of pride in who they are. Marcy. Okay. 
Marcy, Melissa, thank you so much. And uh, really great staff, really great remarks. And, uh, you know, so wonderful to see, uh, you know, that good feeling going towards our families and communities here in the, in the city. And uh, yeah, happy to hear all of that work going to connect with our First Nation communities. As a res boy that grew up and uh, live, still live on the res, uh, you know, it's important to see that because so many of our children are here growing up here and have those needs and families need that support. So to see that cooperation happening is really terrific. Um, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask your questions using the Q&A feature. I've got a few comments uh, to, to Jama here, uh, hoping, uh, you know, uh, some really great stuff. Thank you for including Afro-Indigenous people as a speaker and uh, he's such a moving and eloquent speaker, uh, says Don. So thank you very much for that. Uh, dear brother, we love you with a heart, heart, heart. <laughs> Best warrior with an upside down heart. Yeah, that's a good one. Best warrior. Very nice from Habiba. And uh, a nice comment. And this is one when it's for Jeffrey and, and uh, Jama. The, this person is hoping that the, the keynote the speaker is provided with good host support uh, for, for his presentation. And I'll have to reassure you the fire is here. Our elders are here. And uh, Jama, he's a professional. He does this. He's, he's uh, really uh, a great speaker, a great representative. So, but uh, that comes from a good caring place. So it's nice to see with a red heart and an orange heart. So we got a theme going on on the, uh, on the online. Okay, first question from, uh, from the Q&A feature. Uh, I think it relates to the reform of child welfare, the review of child welfare legislation here in Ontario. Uh, anonymous question. Does this change mean that First Nations will no longer be a part of the Canadian foster system? Uh, I could guess at that, but I'm likely going to turn it over to the experts. So I want to ask uh, Jeffrey, I have a, just a nice short answer because i got a few questions, Jeffrey. For sure. So I would say definitely no. I would say that the, the, the transformation of Indigenous child welfare will be led by First Nations and should be led by First Nations and Inuit and Métis people. I think what one of the things that we're trying to figure out is what that looks like in urban centers, right? And what that looks like for for agencies that um, are are operating exclusively in urban spaces. So I think that the reform moving forward, trying to be short, Bob, yeah. is going to involve taking a lot of direction from First Nations, but also taking direction from community and urban spaces that are accessing those services and and not either or bringing those two things together. Miigwech. Thanks, Jeffrey. I appreciate that answer. And, you know, a little bit more on, on when, when we talk about foster families, we talk about providing that support. Um, we need more families in the community to be ready to take uh, children, to give of themselves that little bit of care that might be needed. Because, you know, the, if we don't have enough families, there are children that are going to be placed outside. And we don't want that to happen. We want people to receive those services and be embraced by their community. So we do encourage parents, families to come forward and support Native child by being uh, that caregiver. So we really encourage you to do that. And that will keep us out of those uh, Western colonial senses of, of the foster care system. Thanks very much. Um, great, uh, great question. Uh, we are, I've got a question here. Uh, can we talk more about the community advisory process? So one of those, com one of those questions that were, uh, were asked and how can the community give feedback? So I'm going to turn this over to Jeffrey again, a little bit more about the community advisory uh, committee and that process. hundred percent. So I think I would say that we started with a small group of folks that we knew had a longstanding relationship with Native Child that had accessed our services over a long period of time because we felt like they were in the best position to tell us what was working well and what needed to change. I think now the process in October is going to be about, as I've said, expanding that. Um, so we're trying to take direction from the advisory themselves about what that process would look like. But I think that um, if you stay um, in touch with our social media channels, there will be information there shortly about ways that other people in the community can get involved in that process. Miigwech. Thanks very much, uh, Jeffrey. Um, question for me, what nation am I from? I'm Nishnabe from Nipissing First Nation. Any Nishnabe in the house? Just me and Ron? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Me, Ron, and Frida. Great. We're surrounded. We're surrounded. Thanks for that question. Uh, yeah, a comment there. Um, you're so inspiring, Jama. Another comment for you. And uh, really appreciating uh, the updates from Jennifer and Melissa uh, on the, the program and hearing the day-to-day -day activities. And it's great to see, uh, you know, the, that being Nishnabe Kwe by uh, as First Nations women to, to do this work. So, miigwech, merci, it says uh, from Dawn. 
Uh, question, how has our public schools history books been updated or changed since this movement? And has it started to gain some international traction? I might take this one, Jeffrey, if I can. Yeah, uh, back when we went to school, all of us went to school, none of this were part of our education, none of it. I think the only thing we learned in school was, you know, the Iroquoian people and the uh, Algonquian people, and the and the textbooks showed us running through the uh, the wilderness uh, with our loincloths chasing after <laughs> woolly mammoths and mastodons. That's the extent of that. We didn't learn about nationhood. We didn't learn about our value systems. We didn't learn about all of these things that we're really truly appreciating with the culture from our knowledge holders and our elders. Today, we're starting to see more and more of our young people, our children getting that education. And that you know, comes through our allies. The, that, that need for allies is so important. But you know, that, that uh, curriculum, all of those things need to be developed by Indigenous people for all Canadians. It has to come from the voice of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. So there are, there's some, certainly a lot more going on now. You know, kids are learning the, the uh, land acknowledgement, learning uh, to sing, learning to, to do that in our communities. But it's, uh, you know, we need to see more. So we need our allies in government, allies at the federal government, the provincial government, to really make sure that our knowledge holders are contributing to that curriculum, that the textbooks need to change. And we need to really have all Canadians understand this and learn more. The one sad thing about reconciliation, if I could sit on the soapbox right now, the one sad thing I, I'm finding these days is reconciliation too often is a political issue. That your support of reconciliation did, is determined by who you vote for at the ballot box every four years. And that is not the way, that is not what we need to see. We need all Canadians, regardless if you're blue or red or, or um, green or pink or orange, we all need to be on board with what reconciliation is. We all need to learn more. That's why days like this is so important. So thanks for, uh, for your question. I uh, got, a, got a comment from Mary who says the uh, Native Child's Red Dress Project was so inspiring. Thank you for all those who are involved. Really great. Um, important question. I'm going to give this one to, uh, to Jeffrey. Um, what or your staff? It's really up to you, Jeffrey. What supports do you offer to youth aging out of care? Jennifer wants that one? All right, Jennifer. Aging out of care. So um, right now, the, there's been a, a stoppage uh, from the ministry uh, during the pandemic uh, so that kids, usually when they turn 21, they aged out of care. Uh, during the pandemic, the ministry stopped that and they just extended it again so that um, kids are, are still eligible for, uh, to, to remain with us until March of 2023. Um, so that's a that's a really good thing because 21 is a young age for anybody to be out on their own um and then of course we always uh would have uh, programs uh that they could always access that native child through holistic and i i think i think jama also has shown us that a lot of kids continue to have relationships with their workers even when they age out of care Thanks. I just wanted to add really quickly that we also have um, an excellent transitional housing program designed specifically to help First Nations, Métis, Inuit youth transitioning out of care or otherwise as a safe place to land and a safe place to stay in that transitional time. We also have uh, our youth drop-in center, which offers a range of programs specifically for youth. And I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything else. We also ensure that we've got all of our healing supports, clinical supports in place for community as they make that shift into more independent living. So lots of programs are available for that age bracket in particular anyone is interested, um, either a youth in or out, exiting care or otherwise, please check out our Native Youth Resource Center. They've got a really good Instagram. I'll tell you. Thanks. Ron, you want to answer that one? I just really quickly as well. Um, we started work uh, of rebuilding and reconnecting with our community partners to make sure that, uh, as Jeffrey said, we don't have to be experts in everything we do, but we do have an obligation to build our community and utilize those resources and connect our, our children, youth, and families with what is out there for them. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, got a comment from Michelle who says uh, Jama's story reminds uh, them of the power of holding space for youth 
youth at risk by honoring their stories, validating your emotions, your experiences, um, you know, hearing those stories and the coping mechanisms that it's taken you. And uh, this person says uh, it inspires them to do more collaborative work with Indigenous youth and communities alike. So, uh, so people like Njema can reach their, their full potential. So a really great and inspiring uh, work. Thank you so much. And uh, oh, and nice words for Native Child. Uh, thank you for the wonderful, informative, inspirational, and insightful event. So thank you so much from Michelle there. Uh, great question. People want to get more involved. They want to do things. Uh, families, there's lots of programming that's offered by Native Child. Here's your chance, staff. Uh, question for all of you. What events, like the learning series, are coming up? And I know you don't have your books in front of you, but uh, yeah, anybody want to try that one? Ron, over to you. What kind of events do we can we expect? Come to Pow Wow tomorrow. No, <laughs> uh, no in addition, <laughs> true, free food pow. Um, I just want to. I, I want. I do want to plug that every every Monday night we do have culture nights. Um, so if you're interested in that, make sure you get connected with us and and reach out to someone on the team or through our our, our Facebook or website, and uh, we can give you more information on that. There's lots of different themes. Uh, we do crafts. We it's all different ages. So please come out, join us. Uh, let's continue to build a community and support each other. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Yes. <laughs> There's also a culture night for youth that happens every Friday at our NYRC location. Free food. Free food. But certainly, if you're inter if you're interested in to in events, if you're interested in the community report that's uh, uploaded there, go to nativechild.org. That's the website, and you could learn more information. Another interesting question: Is there opportunities for students to volunteer with Native Child? We're still building that. I would say. Yeah. That I actually. Yeah. Go ahead, Ron. Go ahead, Ron. Yes, I was. Yeah, um, we I literally sent an email last night at two o'clock. Um, yes, there's lots of opportunities. Again, there's a, a opportunity to actually apply through our website uh, to be a student. And we have uh, there, we're literally looking for some right now. So if you're interested, reach out to us, um, connect with the uh, human resources team through the recruitment page, and we'd be happy to connect you with whatever team you're interested in, in, in participating with and, and helping us. Thanks very much, Ron. I'm getting a few questions related to resources that people can have for their classrooms, for their families. Uh, you know, are there on-site locations where you can participate in these things? Uh, one of the things I would say is, you know, keep your eyes out. A good example is the Native Child Powwow happening tomorrow. Show up at Dufferin Grove Park. Uh, come on out at starting at noon. Come to come to sunrise ceremony. I was happy. I I got the chance to to host the sunrise this morning at Nathan Phillips Square, and there were hundreds of people coming out to to see our knowledge holders and our elders do that work. So it was a it was such a beautiful thing. So come out to sunrise seven o'clock uh, at is it seven o'clock? Six six o'clock. They like to get up early here at Native Child, um, or it might be the kids keeping them up. Who knows? Uh, but uh, yeah, please come out to those events. Uh, go to nativechild.org. Check out the friendship centers. There's two friendship centers in the city: the and, and, um, Native uh, Native Canadian Center of Toronto and uh, Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Center. Great places to start. Uh, First Nations, Métis, Nino, we love Facebook. So uh, yeah, we're, we're not much on Twitter. We're not much on Snapchat or any of those things. We're all on Facebook. So check out the Facebook pages and get some more information that way. But I really appreciate it. You know, we get a lot of comments from people who really want to do more, want to learn more. And, uh, you know, Native Child isn't necessarily the one-stop shop for everything. So, you know, check out all those different agencies. Over 20 Indigenous agencies in the city of Toronto alone. So one of the commitments I really liked is how can we integrate? How can we collaborate? So that's uh, going to be coming up in uh, in that. And I'm going to uh, reiterate some of those um, commitments again. Again, the first one is to expand that uh, that community advisory committee. Expand and continue to guide that transformation by expanding that work. Um, the, the second commitment Jeffrey offered was uh, this new table of Indigenous service providers to better integrate those services. So that's where, you know, we can see a lot of those Indigenous-led, Indigenous servicing organizations help support child and well-being, support Indigenous kids. 
third one is to work with the Association of uh, Native Child and Family Services um, across uh, across Ontario uh, to create and update uh, those different tools needed to help do this work and uh, to help support that work that's going to be happening. And then the fourth commitment Jeffrey offered is to bring the voice of youth to that legislative review taking place here in the province, to make that change, to drive that change from the community. Change and decolonization again can happen with just people in Queens Park doing that. It has to come from indigenous peoples. It has to come from the youth. It has to come from kids that were in care, that continue to be in care and those voices. So really great to see. Um, yeah, and I don't see any, I, I would I'd be happy to collaborate with Native Child to run dance and fitness programs, says uh, somebody. So yeah, continue to volunteer, continue to do that in a good way. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. Can you tell us more about counseling and mental health supports for children and youth? So going to Melissa. Thanks. Great question. That's actually very much one of our wheelhouses. That was one of the first programs um, that Native Child came out with after we birthed our agency. So we offer programming for children uh, as young as three, uh, all the way up to elders, and we provide individual counseling. Uh, and the counseling happens through a cultural, really culturally grounded lens. And we understand the importance of walking that along with Western methodologies. So the folks on our clinical teams are folks who, who step into that work first and foremost as uh, with an Indigenous worldview, and then with some other educational pieces that can support um, if they're that can support that journey from a Western frame as well. So it's really very much about um, walking that path with two-eyed seeing. Uh, so yes, back to what we offer. We offer services for individuals. We have family therapy that we offer, intensive counseling services. Those services can be trauma-focused or they can be supportive counseling. Um, so we really offer a range of therapeutic programs. For the little ones, we really specialize in, in, a, in a modality that's very play-oriented, very age-appropriate. Um, if folks are interested in any of those services, all they need to do is contact our intake line and let us know that you're interested in receiving therapeutic services. And we can connect you to the right resource that you need. And um, you can work with our Mukayam clinic. The number is on our website. Thanks. Wow, that was great. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so that's going to leave us, uh, that's going to help uh, conclude our, our, our morning of great speakers, our, our wonderful um, uh, keynote speaker, Jama, and all of this great, and we're so happy the Deputy Prime Minister stayed with us for this whole thing. I really appreciate, uh, appreciate and the Mayor, of course, uh, being a part of our gathering this morning. I do want to ask uh, Jeffrey Schiffer to come forward and give us uh, final remarks uh, to set us on our way, and then we're going to turn it over to Alita and Roland to close us off but uh, to offer uh, final gratitude is uh, Jeffrey Schiffer. Thank you. Um, so none of this I just want to say really quickly that none of this work is possible without staff, community, partners, government and I think today over the course of all of our speakers we've really heard um, a resounding commitment not simply to reflect and learn but to take knowledge forward into meaningful action um, that will improve the lives, the safety, the health, the well-being of Indigenous children and families across the city of Toronto. That is a, a beautiful commitment that we can make uh, to work forward together collectively. And so I, I just, I also want to thank, because sometimes I forget to do this and then I feel terrible. I want to thank all the staff and our facilities team and our cultural folks and everybody behind the scenes. Yeah. Up, um, because we couldn't do things like this without all of that, that back end support. And people have really been working tirelessly to make this happen. So miigwech to all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Oh, firekeepers. Yeah, part of the cultural team. So yes, our firekeepers out in the back and rolling as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually turn it over to uh, Alita Roll, and I'm not gonna say anything once that the final song is done. Once those words are are done, uh, we will be concluded. Thank you so much for joining us today. Over 400 people, you know, online spending time learning a little bit about truth and reconciliation. This special day, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Don't make this your only thing you're going to do. Don't make this the only learning you're going to do reach out, find other opportunities, go to the library, you know, go on to YouTube. I know everybody loves YouTube, you know, search some of those videos and, and, and stories to hear about residential school survivors. So, you know, put that into your heart, make that part of your truth as well. 
So uh, on my behalf, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. And uh, thanks very much to Native Child and Family Services of Toronto. We're going to turn it over to Alita Sove and uh, Roland Baldhead to offer us our closing song and our closing prayer. So Alita and Roland. Thanks, Bob. And uh, thank you to all of you here who've been in, in uh, person. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I'm getting a tickle in my throat. I need some water. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to turn it over to roll until my throat clears up. <laughs> Wait up. Hey. 